charcoal on there. That's okay. So star exclamation mark. When we say we are charging our phone, uh, this is false the battery in our phone is um, electrically neutral and we're going to talk a little later about what a battery actually does but uh, the main point here is to make a case for this. So what we are doing when we in quotations re-energize our device is to use um, electricity to do chemical work uh, on the battery. Whoever's microphone is open is closed unless you want to speak. Uh, electrical work, or chemical work on the battery. Uh, uh, so, uh, in order to store uh, electrical energy and we'll underline the word energy. So, it is energy not emphasis charge that is stored in a battery and this energy is largely stored by the effects of chemistry uh, it doesn't matter whether the battery is lead acid or lithium ion or whatever, it's still a chemical effect. Uh, and, and these types of rechargeable batteries, the reaction is reversible. Um, especially in the case of lithium ion where you can go through thousands of cycles before the battery is spent. However, there are devices that store electrical energy by accumulating surplus electric charge in their geometries. And so to store energy in those devices, we do put uh, an excess charge in the device. And so an argument can be, well, if this device stores charge, which it does. But we have to do electrical work to put it there, and if the charge is released, you're going to get a little electrical work back out again. Therefore, you have electrical energy is really what's being stored there. Okay, so we have to be mindful, especially as students of all this, of what's really going on and not just the uh, everyday conversational language. So even in the case of a lightning strike from clouds to ground, 
you are still having an, that's an electrical uh, there's electrical work being done there's electrical energy being transferred okay it's not just a static discharge yep question I can't hear you sorry you're broken up I'm sorry I, I it's garbled I can't understand whatever is being asked by somebody okay I will flip to the text and you can type it for me then I'll, I'll make it visible so whoever's uh, here we go no it's the people okay here's the chat so whoever was trying to say something could you just uh, type it please and there's someone's microphone is open I don't know who it is let's see if I can find it here um, Wait, I have a question. It wasn't me before. Yeah, go ahead, Jackie. But uh, when you say in the geometries, is it like it's just like in a specific part of it? Or yeah, it's the actual arch architecture of the unit between the plates or whatever, whatever is actually in the device itself. Okay. So, and we'll come back to that because we're going to talk about it in some length. Um, Ethan, can you turn off your microphone, please? Um, okay. Uh, so, is that good otherwise? I think if Ethan says microphone on, and I think he's the only one. Yeah, he's the only one. Okay, so if if you can you kill it, or I will. Let's see if I can get. I mean, I can mute him. Maybe I can mute Metronium for everyone. To call. <laughs> That's brutal. Okay. <laughs> so Ethan, are you there? Ethan, are you there? No response. Okay, whatever. Okay, so we're good then. So here we go. So it's tricky because one hand we make the point that batteries are energy sources and capacitors are charges. Okay, and yes, that's kind of true. But we want to be a little careful here because the battery certainly is a chemical device and it stores chemical energy. The battery is always electrically neutral. Uh, it's just a matter of whether we separate the charges or the, in the battery in such a way, or the chemical aspect of the battery is such that you create a potential difference, a plus minus across the terminals, and that the chemistry of the battery does work to maintain that as the char as the current flows. In the case of a capacitor, the only thing we have to maintain this is the physical geometry, the physical structure of the device, which somehow is physically preventing the positives and the negatives from getting together. And when we run a current through it in one way, we store up this charge, and then um, later on if you short it out, that charge goes away. And, um, and that's part of your, your experiment, so it's helpful to study this a little bit. Um, and um, so, um, but no matter, no matter what, in all cases we're storing energy. It's just a different way of doing it. The reason that we use batteries overwhelmingly for storing energy is because Given the way the battery is designed, the potential difference, the voltage, if you will, of the battery is remains constant for the longest time. It's very reliable, uh, and especially for the newer batteries, even more so. And so the devices connected to this are very dependent upon that. Whereas a capacitor can have a lot of things happening at the beginning, and then it peters out so that the, the flow is not as uniform. Okay. Now that has its place in electronics as well, but it's less suited to... Uh, to deal with uh, um, supplying a power source for devices. And uh, so the battery is a more stable platform for that. Okay, so we often will just in pejorative sense say that the capacitor stores charge. Uh, and we're gonna talk about even that because even capacitors are more or less electrically neutral as well. So so that even that's a bit pejorative. But uh, the main idea with a capacitor is that the idea of how it stores charge uh, and, and in, the, in an extension, the energy of that. Okay, so uh, let's uh, look at this in some detail here. If I can find my chalk again, wherever that went. Have to cut this out of the video. I just had it. What am I doing? Up here. Such a device is known as a capacitor. I believe 
I won't put it on the board, but my head tells me that if you read older language, uh, they would call them condensers uh, in, the, say, the parlance of the 1950s. So if you're reading older language. But you could always want to look at your circuit diagrams to be sure. Okay, because remember in those days, a lot of the circuits had vacuum tubes in them too, and that's a whole different world of high energy stuff. Because electrical forces are very strong, capacitors, some capacitors can have significant charge on them and it can be quite, uh, they can be dangerous. And the charge can persist for a while. So if you are playing around with an older television where they had the CRT type monitor, uh, the capacitors in those things can be 50, 60,000 volts. And that's very serious stuff. Uh, even if you don't have, and that can stop your heart. So you don't want to mess around in those, and those things can retain charge for quite a while. So just uh, as a caveat, some of you uh, being uh, a creative on the side. Okay, enough of that. Now, in general, one of the easiest ways to do this we bring uh, two um, parallel plates in proximity. And so here's your two plates. We already have talked about it in the last section. We're going to have a very aggressive magnetic field. We'll, or sorry, electric field, pardon me. It's going to be twice that of a single surface. And then a very minor uh, field around the outside. So this is comparatively trivial. And some set it to zero. Uh, not because it is zero, but because it's probably, you know, a thousand or ten thousand of the field inside. Uh, what, so why is that? And it was kind of mentioned before, but we'll just say it. The, in this case with my, um, we would have positives here and negatives here. If I have lots of positives on this plate, my electrons then uh, are, I have extra additional positive charge here, okay? Therefore, the electrons on this plate are going to be brought to the surface closest. And the positive charge will be brought to the surface closest. So the um, distribution of the negative charge on the back of this plate and the positive on the back of this plate, while not zero, will be very small. Uh, now, we said before the charges distri distribute uniformly, and that's true in the absence of an external field. Well, you've got a hell of a field here, so uh, that's going to really change the density. So you're going to have a pretty uniform density in here, some stuff going on at the corners, and not all that much going on on the outside. Okay? Now, we're not going to get into these nuance effects. We're interested only in the center part here and our first look at all this kind of stuff. So... We have here Q positive and here Q negative. So in general, Q plus equals negative Q negative. Um, so the capacitor is also electrically neutral. However, the magnitude, and this is taken positive, of the separated charge is understood. to be the, quote, charge on the capacitor. Now, the um, 
I can't remember in this experiment if we have the RC circuits or not. I think we do, but I can't remember now. So, <clears throat> but a capacitor will pick up a certain amount of charge from the atmosphere around you because you've got ions in the air. It will also discharge <clears throat> through some of the ions in the air as well. So it's, um, you know, even if you have it in the lab uh, and you have the two test leads, it's even though they're not connected, uh, there can still be a fairly a significant amount of discharge or in some cases acquisition of charge as well. So uh, it's, uh, we've got to be careful about, that's just a, a, a lab experimental reality. So when students were um, doing the transient curves, they would charge the capacitors up and, they, and just, you just run a, a, a series of circuits. So you just leave the thing on and just charge it, discharge it, discharge it, just keep uh, using, shorting them out as you go. Because uh, you can't leave it for more than a fraction of a second or you start losing uh, current because of the atmosphere. So there's this reality that we face uh, when we do these things. Okay. We find that the charge on the capacitor and the potential difference for delta V across terminals are proportional. So hence, we have Q proportional to V. Okay. We won't call it delta V. Um, you know what I mean? It's the capacitor's potential difference, voltage, whatever way you want to use the word. And since it's directly proportional, we can extend this. So, yeah, equating with a constant, we get Q is equal to some constant, we'll just use a call of K times V. Now let's understand what this constant tells us about this situation. So, if K is large, so once again, using, if you will, my law of extremes a bit. So if K is large, then a small, um, <clears throat> what's that say about the potential difference for a small charge? We have a small charge here, not too much charge in there, and yet we get a uh, small potential difference, right? Because this number here is fairly large. Um, so, K is large, then the capacitor for a given voltage, a given V, can store. So we'll just choose some arbitrary value. So if K is large, can we store a lot of charge in the capacitor or a small amount? Well, clearly it's a multiplication. We can store a lot of charge. Conversely, if K is small, uh, then you can only store, in comparison for the same potential, a small amount of charge. So K then becomes a measure of the efficiency or effectiveness of a given capacitor's situation and its ability to store charge. So if K is small, then for the same of V, VQ is much less. So K is a measure, a descriptor, let's say. of the ability of a given capacitor to store charge.
call this property the capacitance. And we use capital C. Hence, Q is equal to big C B. Capacitance is measured in farads. Capital F. This is in honor, as you might expect, of uh, Michael Faraday, understandably. His story is quite, quite a story to read. You might, uh, if you have nothing to do, pick up a uh, reference and just see the unbelievable poverty of his youth and how he educated himself initially at public lectures and ultimately became more accomplished than the people who were giving the lectures. It must have been a staggering genius given the hardships of his times. Now, the ferret is a large unit. And also do to the magnitude of electric forces. Most capacitances are <clears throat> of the uh, nano, uh, pico, micro, milli uh, variety. Uh, you will not find uh, very many capacitors of uh, even 500 microfarads, uh, a, a few um, half a farad capacitor that's often, you know, the size of, uh, you know, like if you take a, uh, you say, for example, you have a hard drive, um, like an external hard drive, let's say five or six terabytes, maybe that's the size of a farad capacitor or so that's they're fairly significant. And if you have a large capacitor like that, say more than one farad, even a few more, if you, for some reason, got your hands something like that, please make sure there's usually a metal plate that you can put between the terminals. Please make sure that's always there because these things can pick up a fairly decent charge from the ions in the atmosphere and it can give you a whack, bit of a whack. So you need to, by, by shorting that out, that just can't happen. Okay. All right. So computing capacitance. So the capacitance is largely a function of the geometry of the plates. We seek a an algorithm to compute uh, the capacitance. assume uh, a charge of Q on the plates. So most uh, students uh, enjoy number one. 
to compute the electric field between the plates using Gauss's law. more than you think, uh, and this isn't going to be too bad, we can all do this. Compare the electric field, compute the electric field between the plates using Gauss's law. So you're going to, you have a charge between the plates. So we, we've already done this once in a way and compute the field, which we know in the case of a parallel plate capacitor is uh, to um, sigma over epsilon naught. And now that we have that, there's a spacing between the plates of D or something. So then we multiply the field, which is a force, times the distance. And that gives you the work, which is the potential. And of course, it's just a matter of defining by the charge, of course, to keep it as potential versus potential energy. That gives you V. So now you just rearrange and solve for, um, for C. Now, what you'll notice is that the Q we've assumed will then be in the equation as well. And there's a Q also in the capacitance equation, and it'll fall out, and you'll end up with C is equal to whatever, and it's generally related to the geometry of the plates, the, the distance, the area, whatever it is. So let's have a look. Uh, so calculating uh, E between the plates. This is general right now, and we'll come back to this and look at different geometries, but it gives you at least a taste of it. We enclose one plate with a Gaussian surface. And by definition, Q is the enclosed charge. So from Gauss's law, we're going to have epsilon naught EA. We have, or we could use a rectangular Gaussian surface or whatever it's going to be, uh, because all the field lines that we care about are going to the bottom. Okay, so it's not a, not a complexity. We'll come back to the nuances of each geometry in a minute. But that's, in effect, how you do this. So we'll put here, using a um, carefully selected a Gaussian surface, OK? So then, computing delta V, we have delta V is equal to the integral uh, from initial to final location of E dot ds, which is just work, divided by charge, right? And so then, uh, since 
the electric field is parallel to the displacement, we're going, I rubbed it out, but you know the electric field goes from one plate to the other, so the electric field is pointing from the positive plate to the negative plate, and that's the direction we're going to integrate, so E and S are parallel. So then we just have delta V is equal to ES, so it's actually quite straightforward. And as a memory aid, we get the V is equal to the integral from plus to minus of EDS. So by integrating, uh, moving from the positive plate to the negative plate keeps the potential positive, which is what you're really looking for. And when you ask, what's the voltage across the plate? So say five volts, you don't say negative five volts. Of course, you could reverse the terminals and do it the other way, but no one does that. Okay, a parallel plate capacitor. Let's start with a new panel here. look at this just pictorially speaking. So if I've got two big long plates here. I've got, you know, I'll make them a little wider. So I've got, say, something like this going on. So I've got this field going on here. And I've got this little bit of stuff going on at the edge. Okay? Or I have a smaller plate like this. And I've got, you know, all kinds of stuff here. So what we really mean is, is the fringe effects are a small percentage of the entire field. Okay, that's really what they're saying. So, to wit, the fringe effects so this is okay here and this is not going to work. Okay? Um, or a small percentage I'll use the quotations on small because we can always argue about that of the entire field. Alrighty. <clears throat> so, we assume, so one, we assume Q, uh, two, Q is equal to epsilon naught EA, Three. The plate spacing is D. second. So we have Q is equal to CV. The Q is given by epsilon naught EA equals C times and the potential is given by EV. Right? So the field disappears. And we're going to get the capacitance equal to D over uh, epsilon naught A, if I haven't goofed it up. Let's have a quick look. <clears throat> of course I have. Yes, exactly. Why can't I do grade 9 fractions? So C is equal to epsilon naught A over D. There we go. That's much more like it. So what does that tell us? So 
for a parallel plate capacitor. Uh, C is proportional to the area and C is inversely proportional to the spacing of the plates. And it's interesting that these properties show up. Uh, the seismometers, well they were used on the moon and they may well have been used elsewhere too. Uh, so you're vibrating earth or something. What's the detector that you actually use? And one of them is, is to have these capacitors where the spacing of the capacitor varies with the vibration of the earth or the moon or whatever it is you're measuring. And since the capacitance of interest is, is a function of the spacing, this can be extremely sensitive. Now on the moon, and this is 1960s technology, the astronauts, where they deploy the seismometer, they're walking around the moon 30, 40, 50 feet away, and it's picking up their steps as they walk on the moon. Um, they, uh, when they kicked out things from the lunar module that uh, from 10 or, or say 100, 200 feet away, uh, like their backpacks before they went to take off, and they would hit the lunar soil. Uh, that could be picked up by these seismometers. So it's pretty incredible uh, how, how precise they can be if they're made you know, with the quality uh, in mind. A few years ago, I had a, uh, forget the exact uh, project, but there was a seismometer aspect to it. And a former student of mine, uh, who's a fine uh, electrical engineer now, uh, he decided to take the project on. And he went to the dollar store and bought two large pie plates. They must have been, you know, 50 centimeters in diameter. And he mounted them uh, and used them as his capacitor for as a sensor. So it just shows you, uh, you know, other than they had to be metal, that was about the only constraint. So it is amazing. And this is another point too, uh, when you're dealing with engineering purposes, you'll find that when you start learning about these ideas, and this is true for capacitance and inductance, is that we pick up stray capacitances and stray inductances where we didn't expect them to be. And these um, bastard effects, as they call them, can be a problem. Um, and I'll just foreshadow it because I don't know if I'll get to it. Uh, with our electrical distribution system, the uh, electrical wires that lay across the land, or hydro wires, over the entire sum of Ontario, form a capacitance. Uh, and that's not expected whatsoever. And, and this creates a, an, a, a type of resistance in AC power called reactance. And if we just left that alone, we'd have a very significant line loss. And the idea of being able to run our grids the way we do would be impaired. Uh, we, we can't get past the ohmic resistance short of raising the voltage as high as we can go with them. But this other one's a problem. But you can cancel it out by deliberately putting inductors or coils in your switch arts that effectively uh, cancel out that effect. But uh, without that background, it's, you know, our electrical systems would not work. So there is these uh, effects that show up um, in different cases. Uh, and if you're dealing with uh, precision technology in your work someday, uh, all of these transients, as we want to call them, can really be a challenge to isolate as best you can. Anyhow, there's your parallel plate capacitor. Let's look at a cylindrical one. Question? Yes, please. So yeah, we are just saying that the char there's a charge on the plates, okay? Th that's all we're assuming. We're not assuming any specific charge, but that there's a non-zero charge on the plates. Because if there's a charge on the plates, then using uh, Gauss's law, we can we come up with an expression for what that charge would be. In this example, E not A, uh, epsilon not E A. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. thank you so much. No, you're happy to ask me. Anyone else? Okay. All right, so that's the uh, exact same procedure, but now we're dealing with a cylindrical capacitor. So now we have to be a little bit more careful about what we're doing. Now we're, uh, we're taking liberties here. Uh, what is often done is the two plates are separated by some insulator, a piece of paper or something, and rolled up. So instead of having two concentric cylinders like you would expect in this example, you actually have a spiral, okay? Uh, and so the complexities of that are a little bit more involved, but that's what often is done. And here's a perfect example of what I was saying a minute ago. So if you have a metal can capacitor that has the um, rolled up 
plates in it like that, you get an inductive effect because you in effect have a coil there too. So there becomes other aspects of this that will, can change uh, some of your results. Alrighty. So we'll assume uh, a, a length of L, which would matter, and our radii uh, a would be the inner, lowercase a, and lowercase b would be the outer radius of the outer cylinder. Okay, we've got two cylinders nested in between each other, spaced with air. And we're also going to assume further that the length is much greater than the outer radius. So we have a long, comparatively long, thin uh, capacitor, and that, of course, is simply to to obviate the issue of fringe effects. Okay, and again, this is just theoretical. Um, so this is the gating uh, fringe effects. So, and um, so let's see what happens here. So the area of the cylinder would be equal to uh, two pi r l, okay, side only. Because we're ignoring the fringe effects, so we're not going to worry about the end cap. And um, Q is equal to epsilon naught EA because the field is radiating and it's perpendicular to all places. So this is going to be equal to epsilon naught E 2 pi over uh, 2 pi RL because the A is here, right? And then our electric field then is going to be equal to Q over 2 pi epsilon naught LR. V is equal to an integral from the positive to the negative of EDS. So this is going to be equal to Q over 2 pi epsilon naught L integral from A to B of um, 1 over RDR. And that's going to equal Q over 2 pi epsilon naught L times the ln of B over A. Hence, Uh, C is equal to <clears throat> uh, 2 pi epsilon naught L over the ln of B over A. Now I had said E is uh, the equal to DS, but of course that becomes DR just because of how we do the geometries in this case, but that's not a, a big deal. How much do I got left of this? Okay. <clears throat> What I'm going to do, people, is I'm going to finish this. It's about two and a half pages. It's not that dense. If you want to log off at 3.15, I understand. I will finish it so I can finish the recording. Um, and then I'll post when I'm finished. Spherical capacitors. So as I mentioned the other day, Michael Faraday, uh, used these. You can look on the net. There's pictures of them. So we have concentric uh, spheres without proof here. We get the capacitance is equal to 4 pi uh, epsilon naught B, uh, A, B rather, over B minus A. Okay, if you want to derive that, you can. I'm just going to leave it for now. Uh, and the charged isolated sphere. So I was kind of alluding to this in the at the end of the potential lecture, and I was a, a, a chapter ahead of myself. So if we take someone with Amanda's hair, and she puts her hand on that uh, smooth spherical thing, and they turn it on. She's standing on an isolated pad, and 
shake your hair, your hair all stands up, and we all enjoy this. And it works more effectively with someone with long hair than someone that looks like I do. And how does this work? Well, it's kind of cool because, so from the above, the outer radius is infinity. So you have to recast this equation because you're going to get infinity over infinity and that's not going to work, okay? So what happens is you get uh, c is equal to um, 4 pi epsilon naught um, a over 1 minus a over b. And when you do that, this 1 over a, or this a over b thing will be 0, and you just simply get 4 pi epsilon naught times a, which is the radius of the inner sphere. Now, before we go on, um, yes, please. Um, can you explain why the outer radius becomes infinity? Well, this is the isolated one, like the one at the sign center, so you only have the one surface. So what you're basically doing is if you originally had the two concentric spheres, okay, and you've got this inner sphere where the person puts their hand on when they're isolated and their hair stands on the end and stuff like that, what we're basically saying is we're just taking the other one and moving it away, uh, of, uh, way away from the situation entirely. So the net effect of that is to make the outer radius infin uh, infinity, so it's removed. So you only have the inner one, but you still have this capacitance capability. You can clearly store charge on it. Uh, now you have some background, so you've seen a Van der Graaff generator. That's exactly what we're doing here. No, of course. Now. Uh, while I have this in your mind, uh, if you're traveling somewhere, uh, especially, uh, again, if you're a um, person with longer hair, and you, especially if you're hiking at elevation or the, the weather's a little iffy, and you feel your hair uh, being pulled a little bit, okay, this is a, a dangerous situation which can lead to a discharge, lead to lightning strikes. You don't want to be on a ridge or anywhere near a location where that can happen. Now that doesn't mean it's going to happen in a second, but you are in a case where there is a non-trivial electric field there, and if the electric field gets sufficiently high, there will be a potential difference. So for example, if you're, as I said before, sometimes when you go somewhere else, you, you, you deal with environmental hazards that you're not familiar with here in comparatively benign Ontario. And so, you know, even if you're golfing, okay, uh, and you feel that kind of sense, if there's any kind of sense or you feel something in the, in the metal golf clubs, you get the hell out of there, okay? And worst comes to worst, you, leave, you walk away from a golf game. Uh, if it's in the worst case, you know, you could end up dead. And, it's, and the thing is, there's absolutely no warning with the case of a lightning strike. You just have no idea. And it doesn't always happen when it's raining and there's thunder. It can happen in certain situations without that. So just uh, being mindful, this is a really good test of that. Uh, to tell you that there's local field effects that are non-trivial, okay? Now, moving forward to some fairly easy ideas, but just to show you how they come together, is when we combine capacitors uh, in parallel and series, and what, we, what are the consequences? If you have done them in resistors, uh, perhaps in grade nine, uh, we'll see them soon enough as well. But just to look at what we're trying to do here, So like I said, uh, it's about a quarter after if you want, if you have to go, I understand. I'm going to finish this and post it, but if you want to hang on, I, I'm not going to end the meeting until I'm done. So in series, we have, and of course this is a similar so a symbol for a capacitor. You will also see this symbol as well, okay? This is what we generally call an electrolytic capacitor. And so that means that generally these are metal can capacitors with rolled up plates that have an electrolytic type chemical liquid in them. It's not, a, not the same, but similar to a battery, okay? However, this all works the same. It doesn't matter about that. All right. So what is the consequence here?
So Q1, so this is C1, C2, C3. Q1 will equal Q2, will equal Q3, uh, or you get currents. Doesn't matter about the geometry, okay? And, um, and electrostatics, because of the way conductors are, that happens in the blink of an eye. And um, so Q is equal to CV. And uh, we know that potentials add when we put them in line, okay? So let's just see what happens here. So that means that C1V1 is equal to C2V2 is equal to C3V3, okay? Now we need to convince ourselves of what that means. Oh, okay, I see what I'm doing here. I made it harder. Like always okay so uh, using uh, Kirchhoff's law then the total potential is equal to sorry total potential is equal to the sum of the individuals and V then is equal to Q over C so we have VT if you will is equal to um, Q over CT, which is equal to Q1 over C plus Q2 over C <clears throat> plus Q3. Sorry, just Q, pardon me. I need that one, two, three, the capacitor. There we go. So the charge is the same. So the distinction here then. Hence is that these are the sum of reciprocals. So we have one over CT is equal to the sum of the one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3. So we, the potential differences of each of these are added together, okay, by Kirchhoff's laws. And then the definition of that is Q over C right here. And then, so we just, just add them as we're supposed to, and we know that the total will be this, which is represented by Q over the total capacitance, and then just cast the Qs out. So, resist our capacitors in series, the capacitance goes down. Now, the logic behind this is that it serves to increase the spacing of the plates. Okay, that's what the net effect is of putting capacitors in series. That's not that it's wrong, it's just simply what happens. We then turn around and put them into a parallel form. In parallel, now we have, say, something like this. And same idea here, okay? So here we have um, a, we'll just say this is our, I'll use yellow. This is, a, and I'll use dash plates here. This is our effective total capacitance here, okay? So the charge on each of the plates adds together to form a total amount of charge, okay? So, in this case, uh, QT is equal to the sum of the QKs. And Q is equal to CV. And V1 uh, equals V2 equals V3 because they're connected together. So we know that for sure. Therefore, we have <clears throat> Uh, what am I doing here? Q1, I did that already. So we've got C, uh, V1, and this is CT, is equal to C1, V, no, there's no V1 here, V, plus C2, V, plus C3, V. And so that becomes CT is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3, etc. So in this case, 
you add them in series. So it's the opposite of what resistors do. Um, but why is this true? Well, the net effect of all this is simply increasing the area of the total capacitor, okay? And we know area is a good thing. So it serves to increase the area. Plate area. All right, what else we got left here? So just the energy stuff and then we're done. from generally slight ones. I'm going to talk about a flawed device, of course. Uh, this energy can be released. of it, I won't write it down. One of the things that's appealing to capacitors for researchers is that designing this ahead of time with whatever potential you put on a capacitor allows you to very carefully control the electric field that you have between the plates. And if you have apparatus big enough, this can be a space that you can actually put equipment involved and this is, uh, you know, can be of interest. We've also seen these things in some of the glass tubing from 120 years ago where we're deflecting electrons this way and that and you'd have plates and the electrons would go between them and you could control the electric field that you were establishing there. It's more or less parallel and again you can control it so this makes it a very handy device for experiments. Then, so DW is equal to um, VDQ which is equal to Q over CDQ as you might expect. And the work involved is equal to the integral of dW, which is equal to mm. 1 over C, integral from 0 to Q of Q dQ, which is equal to uh, Q squared over 2C. And um, is also the energy in a capacitor. Ideally, this is the energy stored in the capacitor. So we can do a little bit of adjustments. So we can do u is equal to q squared over 2c, which of course is equal with by just substitution to one half c v squared. Okay. So the definition of c primarily here, or I guess q would probably be more useful. So q is equal to c d. You can do the math; it's not that difficult. Okay. Energy density. This is a topic that's of course of great interest now. In batteries, the greater the energy density, the smaller the battery, or for a given mass of battery, the more energy you can put in it, and always appeals to people. Uh, you have these phones and tablets that in some cases last a long time now compared to what it used to be. So the 
um, assumption is that the energy is stored within the volume of the field. And so it's energy density is mu, capital U over AD. This is the volume, the area of the plates, times the distance between the plates, okay? What you expect, and you've got CV squared over 2AD. And we're just messing around here with algebra, epsilon naught, and then quantity V over D squared, or if you like, one half, Absolutely not, and then the square of the E of the electric field. So, in effect, the energy density of the capacitor varies as the square of the field you could produce between the plates. Okay, and uh, these are different geometries. I don't know if you still see this or not, but in the um, oh, days a few years ago when we had charging up the flash on a camera, you would hear this high pitched whine. And I asked, uh, former student of mine who's, like I said, who's an electrical engineer right now, um, what's going on with that? And he said to me that uh, this is the uh, plates vibrating at high frequency as they charge. So some of these subtle things are pretty cool. Now, what I wanted to do, so that's the dielectric. That's current resistance. Okay. So, all right. Capacitor with a dielectric. So let's understand what dielectric means. So, so far, the space between the plates has been filled with air. And I believe Faraday was the one who did this. Um, they did it by accident, um, put a piece of paper between the plates and the ability to store charge increased. So quite a surprise at the time. So if we fill this space with an insulator. So air is of course an insulator, but better ones. Uh, we can improve the effective capacitance. Now, almost every capacitor that you'll sh you'll have will use some form of this, these dielectrics. And so the dielectric is simply just uh, a fancy word for an insulator. Okay? Yeah, so it was Faraday who did it. Um, so each dielectric has uh, a constant, its own, let's say its own constant. And this uh, this dielectric constant is the Greek letter kappa, which I will draw with serifs on it. And um, so the capacitance, the effective capacitance, if you will, is equal to the capacitive dielectric times the capacitance with an air spacing. So exact same capacitor, and now we just introduce this dielectric in it to see what happens. As such, a correction
to the electric field is required. And so we would have E is equal to 1 over 4 pi uh, kappa epsilon naught q over r squared. And this uh, and the electric field will also equal, in this case, uh, for a surface, kappa underneath times epsilon naught. So what's surprising to this game is that the electric field goes down between the plates, not what you expect. And so I've got a bit more here to just try and make you feel a little more comfortable with that. Dielectrics are often not discussed until second year, depending on the courses and the circumstances you're taking and the university you're in. However, using Gauss's law, we have epsilon naught ring integral of kappa e dot d a equals q. So I guess what we want to say before I get into this in, in a little bit more detail is what's happening here is that for a given electric field, this makes this thing more able to store charge than it would have normally been. That the, by putting this stuff in between, uh, the field is reduced, yet it's more effective at storing charge than it was before, which makes sense uh, in the sense that that's how it would be. So let's, let's look just for a couple of minutes here and then we all get to go home. Well, I don't, but you do, uh, or you're already home, whatever. Let's just see what happens here. So when an insulator, let's uh, topic here, dielectrics and how they work. So when an insulator is placed between plates, between the plates of the capacitor, it is affected Expect by the electric field as well. So, okay, so that doesn't surprise us. Just need another piece of chalk here. couple of choices. We can have a polar dielectric. So here we have permanent uh, dipoles, which we've talked about before. So these will uh, generally align with the field. It won't be perfect because of thermal agitation. So, or we can have a nonpolar dielectric.
produce a induced dipole. The dielectric then will produce an internal V field, or electric field, sorry. And this will be opposite to the field uh, in sense of direction of the external field because. The polar molecules will spin so that if the if positive at the top, then the polar molecules in the dielectric will spin so the negative thing is pointing upward, right? And the positive is towards the negative plate. So therefore, the field will be going the other way, okay? In, in, in the dielectric itself. So, which is <clears throat> less than. Original field and we'll call this Enoch just for a simple okay um, and oriented in the uh, opposite direction All this makes reasonable sense for what we've already said in this course. Yeah, so, and the reason it's less, okay, because the dielectric molecules are largely bonded. So that's why the field is generally less, because they just can't run around the way you'd like them to. So we've had a picture here, and I just wanted to, it seems still odd that if the field is less, somehow we get more charging plates. That seems counterintuitive, hence this few minutes here of explaining this a bit to you, and then we'll, we'll be done. So we've got a plate here and a plate here and our dielectric here and we've got positives and negatives and hence negatives and positives. Okay, this here is going to be E naught and this here will be E sub D going the other way. So the net effect of the dielectric We can still use Gauss's law and we can draw it this way where we include the upper surface here uh, of plate and the top of the dielectric. And so we'll call this Q here, Q naught here, and we'll call this QD for a dielectric just so that we're clear what we're saying. So since the electric field on the dipole is less than the electric field of the plate, this implies further that QD is going to be less than Q0. So epsilon naught ring integral E dot DA is equal to Q 
naught minus QD, since this is the net enclosed charge here, right, from Gauss's law, so that makes perfect sense as well. And E then is equal to, by messing around with this, uh, Q minus, Q naught minus QD, all of it over epsilon naught A. Uh, or um, Q minus Q naught minus QD is equal to uh, Q naught divided by kappa. And if you do it that way, then you're going to get epsilon naught ring integral kappa um, E dot DA equals Q naught, the original one. And um, want to see if I want to read all right so let's go to the last bit here and then because you've been unreasonably patient or asleep so the question of the afternoon then is so why does Capacitance go up if E goes down. That's the question mark. So, but Q is equal to C D. And C then is equal to Q over V. And V is equal to E D. So the short answer is C is equal to Q over ED in this example. But the most important thing is that the capacitance is inversely proportional to the electric field in its own right. And I think what we mean to say is what I said earlier is that if you have a, um, if the thing is a really good capacitor, you don't have to try as hard. You don't need as much voltage. You don't need, so we, we have the same thing here. If the capacitance is more efficient, we don't need as much potential to save a certain amount of charge. So either way, we're okay. So, all right, everyone, thank you very much for listening. That's the story of capacitance. Next day, we will pick up with current and resistance. Thank you for listening. You're most welcome, everyone. Okay, we're all good, or we're gonna we can shut it down, or we can. Any questions? All questions. Otherwise, um, we're all done. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.